Singularity is a 2010 time travel flavored first person shooter developed by Raven Software, who are best known for titles such as Heretic, Hexen, Jedi Academy, and Quake 4. Like many other shooters released around 2010, Singularity is a product of its time. It's a bit of a patchwork of many other first person shooters, but with a lot of its own unique trappings. Over the years, and especially recently, it has become a bit of a cult classic. I think this recent resurgence in popularity is due to its interesting ideas, solid gunplay, and unique setting. It's also seen as the end of Raven Software, with them being reduced down to creating Call of Duty DLC afterwards. That's a pretty empty existence. Singularity had an effective 9 month development cycle, which was probably even less than that because this game came out back when games had to go gold, you know, when they had to be overwhelmingly finished and playable in advance before being put on discs. Singularity is hurt by its time constraints in many observable ways, but it's a Herculean feat that it ended up being as enjoyable as it is. It's easily my favorite game that I've covered on my channel up to this point, but most games I've played on here are super mediocre anyway, so it's not much of a contest. Singularity also happens to be one of my personal favorite games by Raven, but mostly because it's one of their very few titles where the level design isn't genuinely painful and cringeworthy. Singularity has its own set of issues, but overall, it's a fairly memorable and fun romp that you can clear in 5-7 to seven hours. It's a great game to pass a decent chunk of an afternoon or two, and it's fun to come back to and replay now and again. Singularity is still available on Steam to this day. For whatever reason, it's 30 bucks by default, but they take it down to 750 on sale. And thankfully, it runs perfectly fine out of the box, for the most part. It's a tad limited in its options, but you can at least disable a lot of the annoying visual effects every game developer in this era had a hard on for. The biggest problem overall, for me, is the lack of an FOV slider or at least an in game console configure it. Come on, Darkest of Days had that, and that was a really mediocre time travel shooter. The FOV is pretty awful by default. As far as I'm aware, the only way past this is through a program known as Flawless Widescreen, which actually gives you a functional FOV slider. Unfortunately, higher FOV values cause you to see through your own arms. Even when I only increase it by 10 points, I could see straight through my arms. But I prefer that over periscope vomit vision. If you want the FOV increase but don't want to see into your own disembodied shoulders, you just have to personally experiment and compromise. Also, the game lacks subtitles, which is always something that bothers me, especially in a game where a lot of characters have accents or even outright speak Russian. Let's just move along. You play as John U.S. Marine, also known as Captain Renko Nathaniel. <laughs> that name's as American as apple pie. You're on some kind of recon mission to an abandoned Russian island known as Katorga 12. However, as you're arriving, your helicopter is taken down by Time Pulse or whatever. Who could have seen that coming? A video game helicopter getting blown up. Anyways, you survive and arrive at a dock. You head up the coast and enter a building, only accidentally turn back in time and play Stalin with another guy. Demichev. Hate it when that happens. Now, Demichev is retroactively angry at you for saving his life for some reason. You're pursued by his forces until being rescued by not Alex, I forgot her name and decided not to google it for this, who is a part of some kind of secret society dedicated to finding you. The plan involves Captain Reiki acquiring the Time Manipulation Device, TMD for short. The TMD is not only a major plot device, but it's also the major gameplay gimmick, as I'll talk about later. Once he acquires that, he's supposed to rescue the scientist who invented it, Barasov. After that, you must work together to correct all the weird time timeline shenanigans that have been going on. I'll talk more about the story later, when I discuss the ending. For now, just know it's rather minimal. A decent chunk of the story, especially the backstory, is told through written notes and audio logs, which is honestly a boring method of storytelling to me. This game frequently does that thing where someone makes an audio log when a monster is right outside their door, which is a trope that'll always bother me. This is probably one of those things that they simply didn't have the time to patch up. You won't miss any essential story beats if you skip out on the notes and audio logs, at least. So I did say this game is a product of its time, yeah? I mentioned this in a past video and I'll mention it again. There are four horsemen of late aughts first person shooter design. They are regenerating health, iron sights, sprinting, and a two weapon limit. Unfortunately, Singularity has three of these horsemen, only missing out on regenerating health. Now, I do want to be clear that these aren't inherently bad things, but implementation is consistently a major concern. This game features fixed health. I think this is the rarest trend to defy of the era. Almost every shooter of Singularity's time had regenerating health, so it is refreshing to see something different. It's not too big of a deal here since this game is incredibly reasonable in its design and rarely pulls a rug out from under your feet. 
However, I don't really care for the fact that the healing animation disables weapon usage, slows you to a crawl, and can't be cancelled out. That healing animation is one of the deadliest things in the game, for sure. Should have let the player cancel out of it. It's just a little bit of weird design. As for the other horsemen, iron sights aren't a big deal breaker here. Singularity, thankfully, doesn't make hip firing weapons hideously inaccurate. In fact, I think there's only a minor accuracy penalty for not aiming down sights. It doesn't matter with weapons like the shotgun, minigun, and sniper rifle anyways, and you can take an upgrade to increase accuracy all around. So, I forgive the iron sights implementation here. Sprinting is pretty horrendous though, even for the time. I think this is the worst sprint I've ever seen in a video game, lasting for about 3 seconds before Captain Ragu gets exhausted. Listen, I'm underweight and unathletic and I can sprint for a lot longer than that. You're a highly trained professional military crayon eater, so why does he have the lung capacity of an infant? Also, when you sprint, it cancels out reload speed upgrades, which is honestly just an annoying and unnecessary gameplay quirk. As for the 2 weapon limit? Well, I have a lot I want to cover before discussing it, so I'll talk about it later. And like many other shooters of this bygone era, Singularity has multiple upgrade systems. Maybe upgrade systems can be the fifth horseman, I don't know. As you progress through the game, your TMD gets numerous new abilities, more on those later. However, there are two other upgrade systems you can personally engage in. Using weapon modification kits, you can upgrade a weapon's damage, mag capacity, and reload speed. And using a currency scattered about the world called E99, you can upgrade yourself. You can increase your health, time juice capacity, health kit effectiveness, and so forth. Typical basic stat upgrade. Upgrades. Both the weapon and player upgrade systems are about as milk toast as they can possibly get, primarily just being stat boosts or number increases rather than new gimmicks or abilities. Ultimately, you don't really need most upgrades. I beat this game with about 30,000 E99 and I think 6 weapon mod kits left over. Bear in mind that you can buy a lot of stuff with that once of each type of currency, so I was effectively gimping myself. The only one I'd call essential is health kit effectiveness since they're pathetically weak by default. Probably damage and mag size for a good few guns too. Singularity is rather easy overall. I wouldn't say it's a total effortless cakewalk, but it only has a small handful of genuinely tricky segments. You can think of it as a time-traveling all-American action hero power fantasy if you want. The game can be punishing in the moment, at least on hard mode, but it'll give you more than enough health kits, E99, and ammo to push through. Uses of your abilities and upgrades can make a lot of battles an absolute curb stomp. That does mean that most of the difficulty is concentrated in the early game. There's an ill-defined turning point at about the halfway mark where it no longer really poses a challenge and deaths could only come from extreme negligence. I don't mind a power fantasy like this now and then, so it is fine by me, but I know some people are turned off by that. Thankfully, the game generally feels good to play. Enemies die quickly, but so do you if you're not careful. Aiming feels quite smooth, and unless I was using the pistol, I never felt like my aim was off because of bad controls or game design. The fundamental shooting simply feels great to engage with. Though I don't care for this game's lackluster sprint feature, combat is still fairly mobile and you can run and gun to an extent. A lot of enemies have dodgeable attacks and you can reasonably evade or speed kill hit scanners before you get shots off. The combat has a good flow to it for the most part, and distribution of resources is decent even if it's overall on the generous side. Now I want to talk about the guns and powers. The roster of firearms in this game is smaller than average, but I think some extra care went into making most of them, keyword being most, satisfying and consistent. I should mention that there are weapon lockers spread throughout the game that hold all weapons you've previously found, so if you ever want to swap out one of your slots for a sniper or a grenade launcher, you can always visit one of them. It's also where you upgrade your guns and buy ammo too. A good gauge of the quality of a first person shooter arsenal is how good the starting pistol is, so how's a pistol in Singularity? Among the worst in game history, miserable damage, pitiful mag size and ammo capacity, and it feels inaccurate and unnatural to shoot. You're only stuck with it for about 5-10 to 10 minutes in total, so it feels like it's terrible solely for pacing purposes. The pistol is one of two odd ones out of this game. The other is a spike shot, which is a weaker version of a sniper rifle that fires a slow moving projectile that needs to be charged up. I can either use this inefficient and clunky piece of garbage, or I can use a semi-auto sniper rifle capable of slowing time to a near stop. Hard freaking choice. Now that you've bitten into the sesame seed fecal bun on this burger, it's all Kobe beef, gold leaves, and brioche from here on out. The rest of the arsenal feels great in every other imaginable way. Except sound, but we'll get to that later. One specific weapon does shine above all the others, it's the minigun slash autocannon. But it is actually fun to play around with all the other good weapons. Singularity aims for weapons that are tried and true, more so than adventurous, but it still has some tricks up its sleeve. 
Let's start from the beginning. The assault rifle and shotgun are exactly what you'd expect. Reliable all-rounders that can carry you through most fights. Probably the whole game actually. Assault rifle is about as straightforward as it gets, but it feels good to use so it deserves at least a passing mention. The shotgun is notable for being semi-auto and mag-fed, which makes it a pretty reliable little beast. People are too biased in favor of pump actions anyways. Its range is admittedly rather halitosis y but one damage upgrade is enough to make it consistently one-shot most enemies in close quarters. It does fall off a little towards the end, but throughout most of the game it's pretty reliable. Sniper rifle is also great. I usually don't care for sniper rifles too much in first person shooters, but this one has a special alt fire that momentarily slows time to a crawl. A time slowing sniper rifle that makes heads explode on headshots? Oh boy, that's something special. There's also the grenade launcher, which is probably the quirkiest weapon in the arsenal, firing either timed charges or a charge you can mainly control and detonate. The manual control is a cool little gimmick, but you need to completely expose yourself to see where you're rolling it, so it's not practical in combat. There are a couple little puzzles you can use it to solve. Turns out, these grenades can jump. But, anyone who's played Singularity before is probably waiting for my thoughts on the autocannon, or the minigun as I'll call it. Yes, it's an insanely overpowered beast. It's satisfying to use and it both looks and sounds pretty powerful. Nothing in this game can really withstand it. It is fun to run and gun with a minigun in a game from this era. I'll admit that I do fall into the trap of using the upgraded minigun in the late game because it just turns everything into the equivalent of a semi slamming in full speed into a bunch of tuck tucks. Its only real downside is that it slows you down a little and has to spin up before firing. Ammo is easy to come by, surprisingly, and can be bought cheaply from weapon stations. Oh, and fun lore detail. The reason why the minigun's magazine is so small is because it's not a magazine, but actually a battery. The minigun apparently works by constantly rewinding bullets back into it. It's a freaking time minigun. That's just awesome. And how could I ever be forgiven if I didn't talk about the Seeker? It's a bit of this game's equivalent to a power weapon, and it's one heck of a memorable gimmick. When you aim down the sights and fire, you get to control the bullet in slow motion, allowing you to kill enemies without them ever seeing you. It does have some downsides. Ammo is limited, it can't be equipped at a weapon station, and you need to drop it to switch to your other weapons or use a TMD. It's a really fun weapon, but I felt like the game hands it out a bit too much. I think it appears five times in total. They could have sweetened it up by only having it appear, say, three times to make it feel that much more special each time it showed up. Instead, I just ignored it the last time it appeared. That's a shame, overuse of a fun gimmick. Oh, and there's also a rocket launcher that appears a couple of times throughout the game. It actually kind of sucks. Nothing more really add there, so I'll move on to the primary gimmick of this game, the TMD. About 45 or so minutes into the game, you acquire this Russian bootleg power glove, which has its own mana slash time juice bar next to your health. It can do a wide variety of funky things that add a nice sprinkle of spice to the gameplay. All of the TMD powers can be used on the fly since they all have a hot key or contextual trigger. It can get a little awkward to juggle your weapons in a TMD though, since switching back to your weapon switches to your other weapon and not the one you had out when you used it. It's clunky, but I got used to it. Anyways, by default, it can unleash a powerful melee shockwave that instantly kills most enemies and flings them, especially when upgraded. You can activate enemies using a TMD, which has various effects depending on what you use it on. Notably, it instantly kills humans by aging them out of existence, but that consumes way too much power to really be worthwhile. It also acquires bootleg gravity gun telekinesis, which is mostly useful for grabbing items from afar and solving puzzles. Later, you can convert human enemies into reverts, which basically just means they turn into a frenzied mutant. That one is rather niche and didn't always activate when I wanted it to. I do like creating infighting, though. Finally, my personal favorite of the power roster is the Time Bubble, called Deadlock, which creates a bubble that freezes everything but you. It leads to some ridiculous overkill. All of these abilities combined are one of the major factors that make Singularity distinct from other shooters. Mixing them up and getting creative with them adds a nice extra bit of flavor to combat that's already fundamentally solid. The primary problem with the TMD is that you probably won't use it too much in the latter half of the game. Your weapons outpace it in terms of both practicality and sheer power. The minigun is a death dealing machine that renders most of your powers obsolete in combat. The difficulty simply doesn't escalate enough relative to how strong the player can become. 
even if you only purchase a small handful of upgrades, this still happens. Only a couple enemy types are really designed in such a way to encourage use and management of the TMD abilities, but guns are a unanimously reliable solution to your problems. And a more minor problem is that the TMD is often contextual. You can't use it on a lot of things outside of combat. Most of the time you can use it on an environment, it's very obviously deliberately placed, so the TMD can't really interact with the environment organically. Again, this is probably because this game had such a short development time, so they couldn't properly integrate it into the level design. So while I do like the TMD overall, its implementation can feel a bit undercooked at times. It's a fun idea and I enjoy some of the things the game tries to do with it, but it's obvious it's not fully integrated into the game. Before I close this section off, I want to issue you a challenge. Try beating this game on hard mode exclusively using a pistol and a spike shot. You're only allowed to use other weapons when mandatory, like when you first get the sniper rifle or when you stumble across that one environmental puzzle using the grenade launcher. Melee and TMD abilities are fine, but try minimizing the uses of them. I tried doing this challenge, but honestly, it's unbearable and rage inducing, so I didn't get far. It really reaffirmed my hatred for the pistol. This early encounter with the phase mutants, I died seven times here, more than twice as many times than I died the entire playthrough I completed for this video. You don't even have the ammo capacity to get past this without melee, the pistol is just that pathetic. If you successfully complete this challenge, let me know what it was like and provide video evidence, and I'll give you a shout out at the end of a future video. Good luck, cause you'll need it. Okay, so I'm returning to the two weapon limit thing after first mentioning it. How long ago? This is going to be a relatively long tangent, but I ask that you bear with me. This is something I've wanted to talk about for a while because it's always bothered me, and I'll tie it back into Singularity at the end. I wanted to talk more about actual game design on this channel, and this strikes me as a good opportunity to talk about something a lot of people tend to misunderstand. A lot of first-person shooters made in the mid to late aughts have a two-weapon limit, likely to mindlessly copy Halo. As far as I'm aware, Halo Combat Evolved is the first first-person shooter to ever feature such a two-weapon limit. If it wasn't the first, then it at least popularized the trend. Today, it's one of the bedrock first-person shooters being so incomprehensibly influential that it majorly shapes their design to this day. The thing is, Combat Evolved didn't have a two-weapon limit mindlessly tossed into it. Its implementation was based on a specific design philosophy. I'll try to summarize it in three key key points. Number 1. Combat Evolve's weapons were designed with a rock-paper-scissors-esque ideology. The shotgun will typically win in a battle against an assault rifle, but a magnum will typically win in a fight against a shotgun. Every weapon in Combat Evolved has its own niche, with no two weapons having the same general combat role. As a result, every weapon excels in specific situations that no other weapon excels in, so no weapon ever truly falls out of use. Number 2. Jumping off from the previous point, the two weapon limit is intended to make the player thoughtfully balance out their arsenal. Do you take two all-arounders, sacrificing maximum damage output for reliability? Or do you take two power weapons, sacrificing general combat prowess for sheer power? Or do you mix and match them? It's intended to reward the player for coming prepared and thinking tactically. And number three. The player needs an incentive to scavenge and use weapons they normally wouldn't use. With only two free weapon slots, you'll be almost defenseless if both of them run out of ammo. Power weapons won't always be available, but the precious needler always will be. It's a subtle way to make the player deviate from the easiest strategies and to encourage them to play fights in experimental ways. The player is always rewarded for saving ammo, but never harshly punished for running out. Back into Singularity, does it live up to the combat evolved design philosophy? I mean, you probably guessed the answer. It doesn't. The sense of scavenging for weapons is limited. Weapons rarely appear in an environment and they're often situational or seemingly placed only for flavor. Because of the existence of weapon lockers, you can also just take any two weapons you want and completely restock ammo, so there's not much encouragement to experiment beyond your own curiosity. Not helping this is the weapon upgrade system. Upgrading your weapon tends to make a considerable difference, but weapon upgrade kits are limited, so you have to use them wisely. Why wouldn't you use a weapon that you've sunk a decent amount of upgrades into? Why would you ever revert back to using the standard pistol? Or why would you ever use the assault rifle over the minigun? So it's clear that several weapons are rendered obsolete by other weapons, with some of them seemingly only existing to pet out the roster. Chances are, the player will overwhelmingly carry the shotgun assault rifle, with the assault rifle being switched out for the minigun later on. Most of this game's weapons are viable, sure, but combat encounters can easily turn into a minigun mowdown since it effectively serves almost every niche. It's a discouragement from experimenting with less conventional or more situational weapons. Ultimately, this is a game that should have let you carry your whole arsenal at once. There's no reason for a two-weapon limit here. 
Level design in this game is above average, definitely in good territory. It's well rounded and there are very few level design choices I take issue with. That's pretty astounding for a Raven title. I'm surprised they didn't put bland mazes, nigh undodgeable hitscan BS, or damage sponges around every corner like they love to do in their past titles. Maybe the guy responsible for that stuff got fired. Rightfully. Most encounters in Singularity are fair and have a bit more thought put into them than similar titles. A good few encounters have some sort of vertical angle to them. There's a lot of varied cover and sight lines as well, with some encounters strongly favoring a shotgun and others strongly favoring a sniper rifle. On some rare occasions, they even have a degree of circular navigability. This game also completely lacks that common level design issue where enemies pour into arenas from a singular spot. Encounter variety in general is quite high in Singularity, not only for the reasons I just mentioned, but because there is some decent enemy variety and little gimmicks and tricks the game throws at you from time to time. Something Singularity does remarkably well is that almost nothing else stays as welcome. Okay, maybe the Seeker appears a bit too often, but still. There's simply a lot of one-off moments and infrequent environmental challenges in Singularity that show that there was a lot of care put into the general flow of the game. It takes a lot after Half-Life 2 in this regard, maybe even with more variety. Speaking of Half-Life 2, this game has no hesitation to reward exploration. There's plenty of out of the way loot caches, often containing ammo, E99, upgrade blueprints, and sometimes even weapon upgrades. This is something the game does ridiculously well. Going off the beaten path consistently felt rewarding, and if you don't know which way is the explorer's route, there's always a dedicated button that momentarily highlights the correct way. Excellent design. Enemy design tends to be integrated well into level design. Encounters are obviously designed to the enemies you fight in them in mind. There isn't too much to say about the enemy design though, since it's generally a fairly standard roster. You have your standard zombies, mutants that phase in and out of reality, Russian soldiers, heavies, phase ticks, and some occasional boss fights. The game mixes and matches these frequently, so you don't fight any one enemy type for too long before another appears. While I don't have too much to say about most of this roster, I do have to address the phase ticks. Everyone hates the phase ticks. They're what you get when someone decides that the tiny, hard to hit enemies that come in swarms should also be really, really dangerous. I have mixed feelings about them since they do absurd amounts of damage and you typically have minimal time or space to react to them. However, they're the only enemy type that really pushes you to use and manage your abilities since they're often best dealt with using the TMD. The melee shockwave instantly kills them and using the TMD on one makes his comrades turn on it. I like the idea. But did you have to make them so much more obnoxious and dangerous than any other enemy type? And unfortunately, even some of the best level design on my channel up to this point has its failings. Singularity infamously has a problem with a large portion of its environmental puzzles, notably that they involve boxes and aging and de-aging them. I don't think they're quite in horrible environmental puzzle or hep as I nicknamed them, territory, but they're certainly a curveball for a blind player. I was rather baffled by the box puzzles at first when I originally played the game because they simply seem... odd. One of the first puzzles involves a slightly raised door. How do you think you bypass it? Well, you grab a box, age it, and then de-age it under the door. It's so bizarre, like, I thought the game glitched out when I first saw this, and that there was supposed to be a combat encounter here, but no. But that's honestly not even the most absurd example. Try to comprehend this. You've encountered a waist-high elevator that you cannot climb up because Captain Renge's military training never taught him about waist-high walls. The solution to this problem? You have to enter a convenient time portal and travel back in time only to grab a box, take it through the portal, and then age and de-age it under the elevator to climb up. Like, I feel like I'm making really petty use out of my reality-defying abilities. I can quite literally manipulate time, but I use it to open time portals solely to pull boxes into the future to climb waist height objects. The absurdity of this is hilarious to me. It's not a logical solution to the puzzle, it's just Captain Renegade overcomplicating things. And it's not like these puzzles are impossible to figure out or anything, it's simply bizarre that the solution isn't to aise the door until it's rusted off or something like that. That would mean it's not really a puzzle at that point, but isn't that completely logical? Aren't puzzles supposed to be based on logic? Oh, whatever. So, encounter design is typically pleasant. Most fights feel pretty good, there's decent variety, and there's almost no cheap shots or blind killers here. Puzzle design isn't fundamentally bad, but they're repetitive and a bit unintuitive at first because of their inherent absurdity. These flawed puzzles are obviously another result of Raven simply not having the time to refine them. Overall, the level design is very good. It's a pretty large cut above most other first-person shooters, especially others from the era. 
Singularity is a fairly good looking game. From a technical standpoint, there's nothing particularly special about it. It doesn't have any fancy pants tech backing it up or anything. It's simply carried by solid art direction. It substantially features USSR Cold War themes with a generous sprinkling of post-apocalyptic aesthetics in there. Knowing that, it is funny to think that most of this game takes place in 2010. Plus, you can see some influences from other games in here, with a lot of people citing influences from Bioshock. I'm personally not completely sure where people get that from, though. I feel Half-Life a lot more than I feel Bioshock here. The variety in visuals is also quite good, giving you tastes of post-apocalyptic Russia, 1950s labs, and even little teases of something much more alien. It's a shame you don't get to see much of the funky time floor, since I really like how surreal they look. Colors are varied for the time, with the game prominently featuring blues and oranges, a lot of red early on too. The palette is generally dark, but still fairly pronounced. It's a welcome deviation from the astounding amount of grey and brown palettes of the time. In addition, there's clever instances of visual flavor here and there. My personal favorite example example is how the first boss has this little leech monster acting as its weak spot, with it popping out and moving elsewhere when it's injured. Just this little visual twist is enough to make Blue Time Mutant Donkey Kong a far more memorable boss fight. The game's visuals are typically at their best when you have something to look at in the distance. Open-ended areas tend to be surprisingly pleasant to look at. The worst visuals in this game are consistently in the more enclosed spaces. It has some bland utility tunnels at some points, and some brief stretches of square rooms and corridors feel like they were copy and pasted. Lighting is worse in enclosed spaces too. There are some other problems with the visuals. Combat can be a bit flat in the visuals department at times. Most enemies can be dismembered by powerful weapons, which is a great little touch that makes weapons feel a lot more powerful. However, I feel like the rest of the combat effects are rather lacking in comparison, with explosions being some of the most pitiful I've ever seen in a shooter. Corpses disappear quickly and it feels like fights have minimal effects on the environment. Ultimately, the game has stellar art direction, a good palette, and some nice set pieces, but the rest of the visuals can sometimes feel flat, dated, and uninspired. Let's move on to sound design now. Singularity is, for the umpteenth time on my channel, a game where the sound design isn't particularly remarkable. Nothing spectacular and memorable, but nothing horrific and forgettable either. My biggest issue overall was the weapon sounds. I feel like they needed to be a little louder and bassier. Is that a word? They're simply lacking in meatiness. Beyond that, the sound design is mostly alright otherwise. I like the sound effects associated with the TMD. I think they all have a good feel to them. Strange that they didn't put as much care into the gun sounds though. Enemies have distinct callouts so you know when they're puking, warping between realities, or throwing a grenade. So you know, standard Russian military callouts. The ambient sound work is decent, but not all too memorable. Singularity's soundtrack is basically just ambience. I don't hate that, but I do prefer it when game soundtracks have at least a heaping tablespoon of soul. It ramps up from time to time for scripted set pieces and big battles, but it's rather subdued and generic. The game definitely goes for a horror atmosphere with its soundscape most of the time, and that's typically a peak of the sound design. In action-focused levels, it feels a lot more like any other shooter. Overall, Singularity's sound work is alright. It has some hitches, but it's nothing particularly detrimental to the game as a whole. Now, I'm going to talk about the final level and the ending. You can time travel into the future, past the spoilers, by going to this timestamp on screen. You good? It's time to become the Time President. So as I mentioned earlier, you rescue a scientist named Barisov, who effectively just says, Captain Ramirez, do everything, for most of the game. A decent chunk of the mid-game to the late game is just about finding a bomb and charging it. Then you have to bring it to the singularity. Ha! Title drop. Which is apparently the source of all the weird time garbage that's been happening, or something like that. The final level is the biggest power trip in a game, since the game has been kind of been one big power trip anyways. You're forced to take an upgrade that gives you unlimited time juice for the TMD. A bit of a slap in the face for anyone who upgraded his battery capacity, I'm sure. It's a brief stretch of the game and I like it as a send-off. It does remind me of another game though. What other game turns your orange gimmick weapon into a blue super powered weapon at the end? I could waste away half of my life before I'd wager a guess. Two. 
After that curb stomp, you encounter yet another curb stomp. Somehow, the only two major characters in this game have ended up in a nuclear time super death chamber with you. Maybe this game is secretly about teleportation technology, not time travel technology. Anyways, you must choose who you want to side with. The scientist Barasov or dictator Demichev? Who do you think I picked? No, Captain. With Dr. Bar ah. Bet you weren't expecting that one. Unfortunately, the ending proper is rather minimalist, but I like the story here. The USSR collapses, somehow sending the world into chaos. I'm not sure how. Captain Renaming goes rogue and becomes a secret Illuminati president in the United States. No, really. That alone just makes this the best ending, for sure. I think this is supposed to be the very evil ending, but if you ask me, the other two are trash in comparison. The story of this game gets pretty dumb close to the end. Just before you get to shoot the two guys, it's presented as a revelation that you and Demichev were the cause of all the time shenanigans, as if it wasn't obvious from the first five minutes of the game. But then the game states that you're the sole difference between timelines. No, Demichev living is a timeline difference. The game even had an unsubtle plain as day way of conveying this to you. This game isn't even trying to be exceptionally deep with this time travel narrative and it still doesn't really get it. That's why I typically don't care for time travel or universe hopping stories anyways. It's eventually gonna get dumb. At least Darkest of Days didn't try pulling this. The ending is also meant to recontextualize a lot of things throughout the game, with the graffiti on all the walls ostensibly being written by you, Captain Rental. A twist I honestly predicted most of the game in advance. Plus, it's a good thing he gives his future self great advice, like get off the ship before it sinks. The story is one last thing to add to the they probably didn't have the time to patch up the holes tally. So, what are my final thoughts on Singularity? It's a good game that stood the test of time. A lot of games from this era tend to feel dated or like nothing more than copycats of what was popular, but Singularity has its own unique flair and fun ideas to keep it distinct. The game isn't all that challenging overall, but it's a good afternoon killer. It doesn't outstay its welcome and, in spite of its problems, it's still built up on a pretty solid foundation. It's the kind of game I wish we got more of, where the developers wanted to experiment with fun, powers, and gimmicks. Unfortunately, one of the worst parts of Singularity is that it's a good game, but you can tell an even better game died for it. This game was in development for two years before being cancelled and started again from scratch. Raven then had less than a year, roughly 10 months, to rebuild it from scratch. Assumedly, it's nowhere close to what their original vision was. It's kind of a shame, too. This is a game that really deserves expansion. I strongly believe that if this is what they could create in 10 months, then they could have put out something truly incredible given more time. It's obvious that the developers cared and a lot of love and care was put into this final product, even if it needed to be rushed to meet a harsh deadline, such as game development, I suppose. Singularity gets a solid recommendation from me. Definitely my favorite of all the games I've covered up to this point. Gunman Chronicles was good too, but I think Singularity edges it out by a little bit. I definitely like it more than Darkest of Days, which was the other time travel first person shooter I've covered on this channel. Look at that video if you feel like it. With all these time travel shooters, I guess I'm now obligated to cover Time Shift. Maybe I'll grab it when it goes on sale. Chances are it won't be the next game I cover on this channel though. Assuming things go the way I hope they do, my next video will be on a first person shooter that perfectly represents a legend developer's midlife crisis. No guarantees though. See you then, if you haven't already seen me then. Oh, but before I go, I have a quick channel update for those of you who care. I honestly had to rush this video together so it wasn't too long between my uploads. This game wasn't my first choice for this episode, but due to some external delays, I ended up having to put this video together in about four days. I'm planning stuff out a bit more from now on. I'm hoping to upload every two to three weeks on weekends from now on. I'll generally schedule them to be uploaded close to 10 a.m. Pacific time, probably on Sundays. I'm hoping that more consistently timed uploads would be good for this channel. My plans can change depending on other games I stumble across or how I feel about my script or other things. I spent a large chunk of my day editing this together, so I'm tired at this point. See you next time. For real this time.